Of all the weapons in today's military arsenal, perhaps the most advanced are remotely operated vehicles better known as drones, able to carry out reconnaissance and strike missions far behind enemy lines while reducing risk to friendly personnel. These truly are the weapons of the future. But if you've been watching this channel long enough, you'll know that few technologies are as new as they seem. As covered in our previous video, Tesla, Hollywood, and inventing the drone, remotely operated vehicles have been around since 1898, when Serbian-American inventor Nikola Tesla demonstrated a radio-controlled boat at New York's Madison Square Garden. Military drones followed not long after with another American inventor, Charles Kettering, developing an autonomous flying torpedo in 1918. But such vehicles were not restricted to the air and the sea, and during the Second World War, Nazi Germany introduced some of the first drones to see actual combat, a trio of remote-controlled, explosive-laden land vehicles designed to take out enemy fortifications. And while these devices achieved only mixed results, they paved the way for many of the technologies still used by armies today. The first attempts to bring remotely operated vehicles to the battlefield took place during the First World War as both sides turned to increasingly creative means to break the grinding deadlock of trench warfare. In late 1915, the French introduced the Schneider Crocodile Land Torpedo and the Aubrio Gabay Electric Torpedo, small, electronically powered tractor vehicles armed with a 40 kilogram explosive charge. Steered through a control cable spooled out behind it, these devices were designed to be driven across no man's land and remotely detonated to take out enemy barbed wire entanglements, machine gun nests, bunkers, and other obstacles prior to an assault. With their drive and guidance mechanism sealed against moisture, they were capable of crossing all sorts of terrain, including shallow, flooded shell craters, in order to reach their targets. However, in testing, these vehicles proved unreliable, and they were soon abandoned in favor of an even newer and more useful weapon, the tank. And for those of you wondering why these weapons were called torpedoes, long before these became associated with motorized projectiles launched by ships and submarines, it referred instead to stationary naval explosives, what are now commonly called sea mines. The name was a reference to the torpedo fish, a type of ray that produced a powerful electric shock to stun its prey. Over time, the term torpedo was applied to all manner of military explosives. Though land torpedoes did not see combat during the First World War, work on the concept continued through the interwar period, with French vehicle designer Adolphe Cagras developing a remotely controlled explosive vehicle in the 1930s designed to be driven under enemy tanks and detonated. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union developed a series of radio-controlled teletanks based on existing vehicles like the T-18, T-26, and T-37 tank, which were armed with a variety of weapons, including machine guns, flamethrowers, smoke launchers, and 200-kilogram demolition charges that could be placed against enemy fortifications. Lacking cameras or other feedback for the operator and controlled through crude commands like forward, left, and right, teletanks were only used for the most dangerous jobs that would otherwise put a human crew in excessive danger. Used in limited numbers during the Winter War against Finland in 1939 and the opening stages of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, teletanks unfortunately proved a flop on the battlefield, with most being swiftly taken out by enemy aircraft and anti-tank teams. During the Nazi invasion of France in May and June of 1940, Wehrmacht engineering or pioneer units developed a similar strategy for safely taking out enemy fortifications, modifying Panzer I training tanks to be remotely controlled and dropped large explosive charges against the target. At the same time, German forces discovered the prototype of Adolf Gress's remote-controlled anti-tank mine, which the inventor had dumped into the Seine River. Seeing promise in the concept, the Wehrmacht's Ordnance Office directed the Carl F. W. Borgwood Automotive Company in Bremen to develop their own version. The result was the SDKFZ-302 Leiter Ladunstrage, or Light Explosive Charge Carrier, better known as the Goliath. Only 1.5 meters long, 0.85 meters wide, and 0.56 meters tall, and driven by two 1.9 kilowatt electric motors, the diminutive tracked vehicle could only travel at 6 kilometers per hour and carry a 60 kilogram or 100 kilogram explosive charge. The glass was steered via 650-meter triple-strand cable paid out from a drum at the rear and connected to a control box equipped with a simple joystick, while 5-millimeter armor plating protected the internals from small arms fire. Unlike the Soviet teletanks or the field-modified Panzer Ones, the Goliath could not detach its explosive charge, meaning each vehicle could only be used once. Nicknamed Beetle tanks by the Allies. Goliaths first saw combat in early 1942 and were used on every front where German forces fought, typically deployed by special armored and combat engineer units. Most notably, they were used in attempts to prevent the Allied breakout from the Anzio beachhead in Italy in April 1944 and in crushing the Warsaw Uprising in August of that same year. However, it was not long before the many deficiencies of the Goliath design became 
glaringly apparent. For one thing, at 3,000 Reichsmarks apiece, the electric motors were prohibitively expensive, especially for a single-use vehicle, leading Borwood to produce a new version, the SD KFZ 303, powered by a cheaper Zundapp two-stroke two-cylinder piston engine. The vehicle's slow speed also made it highly vulnerable to enemy fire, while its thin armor could not resist anything heavier than a regular rifle bullet. Furthermore, at 370 kilograms, the Goliath was too heavy to be carried by hands and had to be transported around the battlefield using a special trailer. But by far the Goliath's biggest Achilles heel was its control cable, which was highly vulnerable to being damaged. Indeed, during the Warsaw Uprising, the majority of Goliaths were defeated by nothing more sophisticated than extremely brave Polish resistance fighters with wire cutters. And while Goliaths were used in limited numbers against the Allied landings in Normandy in June 1944, most were disabled when Allied naval bombardment severed their control cables. The devices saw greater success during Operation Dragoon, the Allied landings in southern France in August, when several were used to slow the advance of American troops through the Maritime Alps. In the end, a total of 7,564 Goliaths were produced by the end of the war, though as combat weapons they were largely deemed a failure. The Allies captured large numbers of Goliaths and, after brief evaluation, came to much the same conclusion, though the United States Army Air Force pressed a few modified examples into service as aircraft tugs. However, as the Goliath was not destined for extended use, most quickly broke down and were immediately discarded. But the Goliath was not the only remote-operated demolition vehicle used by the Wehrmacht. In 1944, vehicle manufacturer NSU Motorwerk AG introduced the SD KFZ 304 Mittlerer Ladungstrager, better known as the Springer. Based on the company's unusual KDKFZ2 Ketten Krafrad tracked motorcycle, the Springer was modified by removing the front wheel fork and adding a 10mm thick armored box, a 330kg detonation charge, radio control equipment, and a rear driver's compartment to the chassis. In combat, the Springer would be driven to the front line by a driver who would then dismount and switch the vehicle to remote control. Then, like the Goliath, it would be guided to its target and detonated remotely. But while capable of carrying a much larger explosive charge, the Springer suffered from many of the same flaws as Goliath, namely unreliability, high cost, and vulnerability to enemy fire. Consequently, only around 50 Springers were built and fielded before the end of the war. An anti-tank version called the Klein Panzer Wanzer, armed with a 105mm recoilless gun, was also prototyped, but in testing this concept proved unworkable and was never produced. The third and final remote destination vehicle used by the Wehrmacht was the Schwerer Landungstrager Borgwood B4 or Borgwood 4, produced by the same company as the Goliath. Based on the chassis of the Panzer III tank, the Borgwood 4 was originally developed as an ammunition carrier and later as a minesweeper, but proved too expensive and unreliable for either role. So, inspired by the field modified demolition tanks used during the Battle of France, Borgwood instead turned it into a demolition vehicle. Measuring 3.3 meters long and weighing 3.5 tons, like the Springer, the Borgwood 4 was driven within range of the target by a human driver who then closed off the driver's compartment with an armor plate to protect the radio guidance equipment. The vehicle was then driven remotely the rest of the way to the target. However, unlike the Springer and Goliath, the Borgwood's 450 kg demolition charge was detachable, allowing the vehicle to be reused multiple times. At 20 mm, its armor plating was also thicker, but even this was ineffective against the lightest anti-tank guns of the period. Several different versions of the Borgwood 4 were produced, differing mainly in armor thickness, engine power, and radio equipment. Some examples were experimentally fitted with television cameras and even propellers and floats for crossing rivers, while around 56 were converted into Panzerjager Wanzer tank destroyers armed with six tube-launching 88mm RPZB 54-1 anti-tank rockets. 1,181 Borgwood 4s were produced before the end of the war, the type being used in limited numbers at Sevastopol and Kursk on the Eastern Front, Anzio in Italy, and during the 1945 Battle of Berlin. But while its detachable warhead theoretically made the Borgwood more cost-effective than its smaller cousins, it still suffered from many of the same shortcomings and, like so many German secret weapons, it had little impact on the final outcome of the war. Nonetheless, the concept of remotely controlled track demolition charge did prove to be an attractive one, with the British engineering firm Metropolitan Vickers independently producing a similar design called the Mobile Landmine in 1940. The device went through multiple trials but suffered from the same shortcomings as the Goliath and was cancelled in 1944. But the basic concept never really went away. 
And in the 1970s, British Army bomb disposal units operating in Northern Ireland modified a self-propelled wheelbarrow into a robot capable of remotely inspecting and disarming suspected explosive devices. The descendants of this improvised bomb disposal robot are now used all around the world and still affectionately nicknamed wheelbarrows. And for more on this, please do check out our previous video, Has Anyone Ever Really Cut the Red Wire to Defuse a Bomb? And What Is It Really Like to Be on a Bomb Squad? So while Germans' World War II combat robots were limited by their technology of the time, they were nonetheless on the right track, demonstrating once more that there is truly nothing new under the sun.